term on the diplomatic dialogue. So we have a person with uh, 60 years of experience of job experience. So it will be pretty hard for me to uh, mention everything and all the job titles that uh, uh, Dr. Kasim Laka had in his life. But uh, I will try to cover the main things. Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming. Yeah. So I've been waiting for this night uh, very long. Uh, really, uh, AKDN is working in 30 countries, and I think we have translation to many of these countries tonight. Uh, 80,000 people work in the AKDN network, and uh, definitely we are speaking tonight with, a, with one of the key people in the whole network. So uh, I will be reading some things, not to forget. Um, Dr. Kasim Laka is the diplomatic representative of AKDN to Kyrgyz Republic. He speaks seven languages. Uh, very interesting fact for me. Including the last languages I have never heard about, <laughs> but you know the languages. Uh, it's English, French, Urdu, Punjabi, Bengali, Gujarati, and Swahili, right? Uh, Dr. Kasim Laka is also the chairman of Board of Trustees of University of Central Asia, and uh, I'm very uh, happy to know that uh, University of Central Asia headquarters is located in Bishkek, and uh, we know the university was. Uh, the university project existed for many years, and uh, since uh, Dr. Kasim Lakhai is here, everything, everything just accelerated. We finally have the campuses, great campuses in Narin and uh, Horok, and now the campus in Tekeli in Kazakhstan is being built. Um, he's uh, the founding president of the Aga Khan University. So Aga Khan Network has two universities, uh, around the world. One is U University of Central Asia, another is Aga Khan University. By the way, University, uh, Aga Khan University in, uh, in Pakistan is uh, top 100 medical schools in the world, as I know. And this is all one of the accomplishments that uh, Dr. Kasim Laka has. Um, he, what, what's interesting also is that uh, Dr. Kasim Laka was, uh, was participating in the planning and startup of Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. And I think Nazarbayev University and University of Central Asia are the two really international, really universities that can be called Harvards of Central Asia. That's very important. Uh, I found out during the preparation that uh, at some point Dr. Kasim Laha was also Minister of Education to Pakistan, huge country. And uh, maybe we'll speak about this experience too, because definitely your experience in education is very appreciated. Um, he chaired the committee that wrote Pakistan's National Environment Protection Act. I think uh, with, with the smoke that we have in Bishkek, this is also a very important part. Maybe we'll speak about that. Um, also, it was very interesting for me to find out that uh, Dr. Kasim Laka was part of the board, of the World Board of uh, International Baccalaureate Organization. Uh, and we have uh, Bishkek International School, the first school in Kyrgyzstan that has uh, international baccalaureate. So I know that uh, this program is, uh, is huge, it's very important, it's growing very fast. And it was very interesting to find out that you were part of the world's board. Um, he is senior distinguished fellow at the Munk School of Global Affairs, University of Toronto. Has uh, written several book chapters and articles on school and higher education on educational reforms, philanthropy, civil society, and management. So uh, overall, as I said, uh, Dr. Kasim Laha has more than 60 years of uh, job experience. But as I know, all these years, uh, most of these years, you spent inside AKDN. True. Uh, he received an undergraduate education in the UK and MBA from University of Minnesota. and. Uh, so before we start, I also would like uh, to ask you to cover what I haven't covered in your career and what you find very interesting. And second, uh, to cover a little bit on what uh, AKDN is doing worldwide and in Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. Thank you so much for this very generous introduction. And um, also I want to thank all of you coming in such large numbers. 
uh, I'm actually quite amazed at what you have done. Thank you. Uh, it is not because it is a nice, exciting idea, but what excites me is the remarkable support system that you have put together to enable young entrepreneurs to dream their dream, to make their dream a reality. And uh, that is something does not happen every time. As somebody, I have worked with young people for a very large part of my life. I think this is absolutely remarkable. And I am also amazed that from the day one, you are making money. And we work is getting into trouble. <laughs> uh, so maybe there is some know-how from Kyrgyzstan that has to be shared with Wall Street. Uh, it actually tells me that a good idea, properly implemented, with sensible approach, is always possible, no matter which country you are in. You don't have to be an American or a Russian or a Chinese or, a, or an Indian or whatever. You can bring the best ideas. And I just wanted to compliment Thank you. the remarkable success of all your I was in Osh. I was very very pleased to see that. I saw the one here earlier. In Asamba, uh, yeah. yeah. And um, I'm happy that the Aga Khan Development Network, through the Accelerate Prosperity Initiative, is an investor in, in, in Osh. So that's, that's what we want to do. When, when you ask me about the Aga Khan Development Network, we say that uh, one of our objectives is to see how we can help to improve the quality of life of the people in the countries. <laughs> it's a very straightforward one line, bottom line state. Improve the quality of the people uh, in the countries in which we are invited to work. And uh, one, uh, a couple of other important uh, characteristics of the Aga Khan Development Network. Uh, unlike many development organizations, we don't just focus on one or two dimensions. For example, some people, some foundations or some organizations focus on education, some on health, some on economic development, some on women's development or children's uh, activities. In our uh, case, we work uh, in every area economic development, social development. So economic development includes financial services, tourism, aviation, manufacturing, insurance, and so forth. And we uh, work in the social side in the area of schools, universities, early childhood development, complete array, then in health, primary health care, secondary health care, tertiary health care, in uh, uh, in uh, the foundation world, we work uh, in a variety of activities like the Aga Khan Foundation does in rural development, mm -hmm. development of local government, development of school boards, many, many different initiatives, and finally, health in a very big way. We have operated around the world over 200 schools. We have over three 400 health centers around major teaching hospitals in many countries and the Aga Khan University you mentioned uh, while I was president we started in Pakistan but we then started campuses and uh, hospitals and, and school uh, and colleges in uh, Kenya in Tanzania in Uganda in Afghanistan and in London England so uh, the idea is that it should be international that's a lesson that we learned when we came to University of Central Asia, it was not so complicated to work with three countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, who are the founders of the University of Central Asia, together with the Zionist Yagi. So finally, in addition to economic development and social development, we have uh, cultural development. Mm -hmm. There is a saying in English, I'm sure there is one in Kyrgyz or in Russian, that man does not live by bread alone. Mm -hmm. If you are eating a good living, that's not enough that you have enough income and you feed your children and your family and so forth. 
but you need culture. A country needs a unity of culture. Remarkable thing that you see in Kyrgyzstan, it is just, for me, it has been a big eye-opener. Small country, but so much cultural rich. Whether it's the Manas, Epic, and the little boy, the other day I was in Ololo house where we had the function. The little boy of five years old was reciting Manas. I was just amazed. How he was taught and how the, the sentiment that he put, the emotion he put into the Manas. I mean, that is culture. Here is Razia sitting here. Uh, she is head, uh, heading our uh, cultural wing in Kyrgyzstan. She had a concert just two days ago. It was a remarkable concert because in seven, we teach in the schools of Kyrgyzstan across the country, 7,500 students are learning to play kumul, to play the, uh, the harp, yeah. and to play uh, all the melodies of the Kyrgyz culture. We are not talking about rock and roll. That's not the music we are talking about. We are talking about the Kyrgyz musical traditions and also how to, how to train the teachers who can teach. It's easy to talk about teaching how to play the Kumos or, or the Kumos. But if you can teach, teach the teachers, and we are also working in the cultural side on uh, particularly across Central Asia, we have a major program for, I don't know if any of you know Kirk Kirs. Kirk Kirs is the 40 women. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kirk Kirs, yes. Kirk. Yeah. And that program is coming next year to do Bishkek. It has been uh, staged in Tashkent, in uh, London, in Paris, in New York, in Boston, and uh, in Germany. And it's coming here. And the, the all the actors there, the women are from Kyrgyzstan and, uh, and, uh, and Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. <laughs> and it is written by the most famous Uzbek uh, composer. Beautiful music, beautiful poetry. This is what we have done across the world. So economic development, social development, cultural development, what we call holistic development of a society. Individuals and society. That's what the AKDN is. Finally, when we go into a country, we usually go when we are invited. Yeah. We don't just go there and oh, what can we do for you? Uh, it, it happened also in this country. Uh, the government invited the Zionist Aga Khan to come and uh, um, help in the development in the early days after the independence. Mm -hmm. I was there at the time in 1995, and it was uh, also very nice to see how uh, energetic the nation was in those. <laughs> And so they asked what uh, we can do for you. And so we asked the, the government, what are your needs? They said our immediate needs are financial services because it's a new country. We don't have uh, our own bank or our own uh, financial services. And we want good education. So immediately in 2000, the, the Aga Khan School in Osho was opened. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, uh, 2002, I think it was it, it was open, and we had uh, the KICB Bank, which was the Kyrgyz Bank. For the first time, Kyrgyzstan had a major bank. The government owns the shares in it. Many development international partners own the share in it, and the Aga Khan Development Network is now the majority shareholders. And you can see what has happened over the last 15 years at KICB. We have microfinance also, an insurance company, Jubilee Insurance. So these are the ways in which we can help economic and social development. Of course, the University of Central Asia is there. So I'll stop here for a moment because I'm sure there are many people wanting to know more. Yeah. But, uh, you, you've touched a little bit on that, but uh, uh, can you also maybe mention the criteria how Akidian chooses the countries where it will operate? I understand the, yes, first of all, they should be invited but uh, as I understand we are speaking about developing countries and mountain countries why why mountains why is it so important what it, yeah so uh, when we when we uh, go into a country we go by indicate but those countries that are the Muslim majority or where there is a large 
Muslim minority. Those are the countries we usually focus on because uh, our institution is a Muslim institution. And uh, we don't mind going to places like Mozambique where there is uh, maybe the majority is uh, not Muslim, but there is a very large Muslim African majority. Or in Mali, or in Ivory Coast, or in um, Burkina Faso, or in uh, Uganda. Uganda, 30-40% of the people are Muslim. So they asked us to help, and uh, the, some of the uh, activities that we do in we are focused on Asia and Africa. Mm -hmm. We are not involved in, um, in the South America. In Canada and the United States, we are there. There are Muslim minorities there, but also those countries are contributors to the development of the uh, the Asian and African countries because they contribute to their aid programs or the citizens go for walks. We collect millions of dollars with citizens in America or Canada walking for development of Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan, Tajikistan or Kenya or wherever. So that is how we select. The characteristic of the country is essentially Muslim or benefiting Muslim uh, populations. Now, if we work to support Muslim populations, it does not mean that we only support the Muslims of that country. Yeah. So if there is a program for, let's say, a school, and if it is in a Uganda, and there are many Muslims coming, but we are also very happy if Christians are coming, or if Hindus are coming, or Buddhists are coming, we are very happy. It is for everybody. No, there is never discrimination. Whoever is meritorious, and who is capable of getting into the school, then they are. And most of the schools and universities, we um, we have tuition fees. It's a private, but it's not for profit. All of our institutions are not for profit. Mm -hmm. Hospitals or schools or clinics. Uh, and we have in Pakistan alone over 300 clinics. Uh, in India, we have lots of them. So we have to have enough support from our own network and other philanthropists to support the care or education. You'll be interested to know that at the University of Central Asia, the fees are for advertised fee is $5,000 for tuition, $3,000 for room, board, and, and uh, laptop, and health insurance. But the average student pays $1,450 in SOM. Not in dollars. So it is less than $120, or if you uh, look at in Psalms, it's about 85 to 90,000 Psalms a uh, 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 month, which is paid on to, sorry, a, 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 a month is 8,000, eight and a half to 9,000 Psalms for the university education, including food and everything else. This is cheaper than most of the private schools. It is definitely. Yeah. Much cheaper than the uh, Bishkek Bishkek International School. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, you've touched on that, and I uh, also wanted to ask you, uh, yes, you're saying uh, it's a Muslim fund uh, foundation. However, uh, everywhere you mention that, for example, if you speak about University of Central Asia, it's a secular uh, organization, and uh, and of, especially in Kyrgyzstan nowadays, there are so many misunderstandings about Islam, about how Islam can participate in our lives. Is it a threat or is it something that brings benefit for the country? How do you combine this secular approach with your Muslim DNA in the organization? What is the synergy maybe that you find? Yeah, can you touch on that, please? It's a very, very important question. Well, first of all, I just want to reinforce the point you made uh, <clears throat> that University of Central Asia is a secular institution. I will come maybe at an, another occasion to tell you why we are focused on the mountain, which I have not ah, yes. yet answered yet. But let's stay with the secular or religious issues. The reality is that education is for all whether you are Muslim or you are Christian or you are whatever. And therefore, a university that you establish 
should be focused on the secular education of the people. Number two, religion is a private matter. There are schools of religious teaching. They, they teach, uh, and become, you know, the, the, the Imam Khatibs have their own schools, Muftis have their own programs, which is fine. But this is a public institution, and so that was the reason why the three governments, which are the sponsors of the university and the Aga Khan, we said it will be not for profit, it will be private, and it will be secular. Secondly, uh, religion is in this day and age somehow is being seen as a dividing factor. Mm -hmm. It is very sad. Actually, we should look at all the <clears throat> commonalities between religion. You know, if you look at Judaism or Christianity or Islam, the uniting factor is Prophet Abraham, <clears throat> or Ibrahim, as we call it. That is the Abrahamic tradition that we should be looking at. What is that tradition? God is one. Mm -hmm. One book. One approach. One humanity. We should be looking at humanity. And in, in the Quran, Allah has said, that I have created you different one from the other mm -hmm. so that you may understand each other better. Mm. Not because then you can fight with each other better. How can we create strength in diversity? Pluralism is something that has to be accepted as part of Islamic ethics. No. It is not something that comes from the West. It is absolutely in the Islamic ethic Pluralism and diversity of cultures, diversity of beliefs, diversity of even within Islam, you have different tariqas, different madhavs, which is fine. But today, Islam has become politicized. It is not only in your home and in your masjid, but it has become politicized. People are using, unfortunately, uh, it, it is not only today, it has happened in the past also. But we as informed citizens can make a difference by, <clears throat> <excuse me. clears throat> by bringing together what is, what is it that is common. All of us pray every day. That is a common fact. All of us, we believe in one Allah or one God. It doesn't matter you are Christian, you believe in God. <clears throat> but it's the same entity that is the creator of everything. So I would say that we should be much more broad-minded, much more broader in our understanding of religion and particularly Islam. There is a tendency to take a very narrow interpretation. And I am right because I am this and that. <laughs> this is not fair. You should tolerate and you should accept other people's beliefs. Great thing. By the way, that is something that I notice in this country. It has had a very strong tradition of pluralism. There are so many nationalities in this in this country. I'm told there are 130 or 40 nationalities living, which is wonderful. Of course, Kyrgyz nationality is the is the is the majority, but it is nice to see, and I see that in Kazakhstan, I see that in many other parts of the former Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and I, in many other countries as well. So you have a very interesting situation. Great. My uh, one of my former colleagues was saying that uh, when uh, His Highness came to Kyrgyzstan first time, uh, all of uh, all of the members of parliament that were surrounding him, I mean members of parliament of Kyrgyzstan, were telling him, "Yes, so Islam is developing so fast in Kyrgyzstan. We are building so many mosques." They were trying to impress him, him with his with this, and he was saying, "Yes, yes, mosques are important. Islam is important, but..." you should, first of all, develop computer literacy. And that was really impressive. Coming from an imam. Yeah. It is more important to see he's a religious head. His, his main, <coughs> his main uh, <coughs> title is that he's an imam of uh, one, one, one uh, branch of uh, Islam. So coming from that, uh, let me just mention the Can I ask you just to keep closer? Yeah. The philosophy behind it is that if you look at the Quran and if you look at the Hadith of the Holy Prophet, it says that we ask 
you as human beings, O mankind, think of the Creator and what He has created. Think of all the things and the glories that have been created for your benefit. Think of the moon and the sun, why they are moving in a given direction, in a given circuit. What is that? That's science. The, Allah is asking us to think and to search. The second part, all the knowledge that we have is not coming out of our head. There is also knowledge that is given. And in the Quran it is very clear, mentioned that to man we have given knowledge but little. Mm. When we wish to have that knowledge in the human being, we will, we meaning the great being, we will, when we give some knowledge, a new discovery is made, a new un insight, a new uh, uh, understanding is created. So we must not think we are the creators. We may have discovered many things, the genes and what, but the genes were created by some, mm -hmm. some different being. We only understood how they function. Yes. So I would say, in the end, the most important part to remember is that there is no difference between Islam and science. It's the using of our intellect. And the more intellect we use, the more we understand the higher being and, and we understand the mysteries of Allah okay. and they have more stronger faith as a result. Sorry, I sounded like a, a mullah, but I... <laughs> but really, uh, it's important to hear this because we hear a lot of other things yeah. about uh, Islam and yes, from people like you mentioned. Uh, so uh, to speak about AKDN again, uh, what are the key targets that you have during your mission in Kyrgyzstan? What would you feel as a good job after you leave Kyrgyzstan? What will I feel as yeah. if it has been well done? Yeah. Uh, I think probably um, there are two parts. One is the physical part, which mm -hmm. is, for example, the University of Central Asia's campus. Uh, I was very fortunate. I had a very good team and we went immediately and we get very good support from His Highness who provided the money but also tremendous support from the government mm -hmm. not only from the Bishkek government but also from Narin government mm -hmm. and the people of Narin I when I go to Narin I feel like I am a Narin man I feel very and they told they tell me as I am your brother I, I sit down with them and I eat one victory day I am in Narin I enjoy their celebration on Independence Day, very often I will go to Narin and enjoy the Independence Day, 31st of August. Uh, I love the letter from Narin. The music of letter from Narin is, is absolutely making sense to me. I love it. Uh, and uh, so the second part, as I said, is the love and affection that I have felt from the people of this country. And I think I may have helped to bridge a little bit of that understanding. So that would be something I hope I'm leaving behind. A certain sentiment, a certain feeling of brotherliness, something that we can do together. And it could be maybe the young people who are now being educated at the university. I was there on Monday. I spent time with the young people, understanding what their aspirations are when they grow and they, 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 they graduate. And it was nice to see uh, a young woman from Narin, Jildij. She was, uh, I've known her from the time she joined the university and she went last year to Seattle. She had an internship in Seattle. Her mind has opened up. This year she is going somewhere else and she's getting good sponsorship. And she's a girl from Narin. And her mind has opened up completely. That to me is a big achievement. And one day, it is people like Jildij who will one day become the leaders of their profession. They may become the leaders of their town. Education is what is going to make me feel very happy that I've left something behind. Yeah, the University of Central Asia is a very long-term project. Uh, as I know, more than $100 million invested into one phase in each of the campuses and uh, when I was 
asking to one of your colleagues, what's the point to invest so much to build a, to build a university for 150 students? Uh, he told me that uh, AKDN has very long-term vision. So the university is built for 100 years ahead. And from this perspective, yes, it makes sense to invest this much. And I was wondering, um, because you are part of the key core team of the AKDN, how does this strategic uh, thinking, strategic process happen in AKDN? How do you do that? How do you think of 100 years ahead? It's a very, very important question. Sometimes I wish I had the full answer. <laughs> um, no, our, our, our um, founder and the leader, uh, His Highness Yaga Khan, he has a very clear vision. His lineage, his descend, he's a descendant of the Holy Prophet. That's our belief. For 1400 years, there has been one generation after the other. So we are not investing for tomorrow morning. We are not investing for here and now, we make money, we put or, or profit or whatever, and we finish with it. Even the ICB Bank is an example, making money. I think you are making money, Mr. Joy. Uh, but then they are investing in the community. They have made a major program of investing for scholarships for universities in this country. I don't know if I may announce it, but $500,000 over the next five years, they're investing in scholarship for universities wow. in this country. That is the purpose of making money, not just for, for shareholders only. And the shareholders are saying, hey, we are making money. You should also invest in the community. So it's a long-term vision. And if you want to grow wheat, uh, if you want to grow prosperity for one year, Chinese saying is that you grow wheat. If you want to grow uh, prosperity for maybe 10 years, uh, and then you can grow other crops. If it's for 100 years, you grow forest, tea. But if it's for 1,000 years, grow people. Mm grow people. So that to me is the most important priority of this country or any developing country. Unfortunately, that priority is not uh, addressed either adequately or properly thought through. As a minister, former minister of education, I can tell you <clears throat> that even Pakistan with 200 million people, it was very difficult how to educate all these people. And it is, for you it is easier, oh, yeah. much easier. And so I will only urge you young people and especially the, those responsible for education, the only way out for a nation such as this is to educate the people. Full stop. Let me give you an illustration. There is a mountain country in the world, which is one of the most prosperous countries of the world. Can anybody tell me what is that mountain country? Switzerland. Immediately everybody said Switzerland. Now, do you know that 300 years or even 200 years ago, what was the profession of the Swiss? They well, were soldiers. They were mercenaries. They used to go and fight for the Germans, Austro-Hungarians, and even in the Pope's uh, uh, bodyguards, only Swiss were always recruited. Even today, only Swiss are recruited in old military uniform with a helmet and everything. And the Swiss were only known as fighters. Why? They had no, their land like you have very little agriculture, and they had no, nothing grew very much. Mm -hmm. They had to go out. How did they change? Today you ask a Swiss, please leave Switzerland, or please leave the mountain and come into the city. Oh, it's polluted. I don't want to go into the city. What happened? You ask a Narin guy, or in Atbashi, where you want, oh, I want to go to Bishkek. So what is the secret? They focused on education. And what happened? 
They went into education for engineering, for pharmaceuticals and chemicals, in, in heavy engineering, watches, into light engineering, and major uh, consumer production like Nestle. Now, what happened there was those who could not be engineers or chemical engineers or manufacturing, they started making cheese. Every valley in Switzerland has a different cheese. Like every valley in Kyrgyzstan has a different honey or different types of products. So tourism is there in the winter time for skiing and in the summertime for hiking. And every farmer has two rooms kept for the guests who can come and live. He can make income no matter what it is, summer or winter. And then he will sell them the cheese. So that's a lesson that could be learned by any mountain society. Education. Only answer. I was speaking to the Japanese ambassador today. I was having lunch with him. How did Japan become the powerhouse it is? Didn't have any minerals, no oil, no gas, nothing. People. Korea. Same thing. So I will only leave one message for you young people and for all the people who are responsible for policy making, focus on education. So the answer is mosques are not as important as learning also computer science and anything else that educates the mind. Because once the mind is educated, we think of it. We think of the other being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In an empty stomach, you can't think of anything. Okay, great. So now I think it's a good uh, moment to speak about mountains. When you look at location of Horok, Narayan, and Tekeli, these are very remote areas in each of the countries. Maybe Tekeli is closer to Almaty than Horok to Dushanbe and Narayan to Bishkek. But if you look at them, they're like located on one line. What is the, what is the reason why you selected these locations? And uh, again, to speak about mountains. So it is a very good observation, I must say. You have a very keen eye for this. When we selected the, the mountain locations, first let's uh, uh, speak a little bit about it. Yeah. Um, we, we discussed with people in, in all these three countries, government and academics. So we found there were many universities in the capital cities. And so one more university in Bishkek or in, uh, uh, in Almaty, in those days Almaty was more popular than Astana, or in Dushanbe, it makes no difference. But we also found that people who live in mountain areas usually are the poorer people of the nation. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a scientific fact or economic fact that the higher you live on the mountain, the poorer you are. So there's an inverse ratio between the height at which you live and your income level. Because you have very short season, your animals are not so healthy or not so big. Uh, you, you don't have uh, so many land to cultivate and so forth. And then you are deprived of government services like education, health and so forth. So you become marginalized. You're living in any mountain countries, whether it's Nepal or it's Kashmir or it is uh, Chechenia or wherever it may be. When you are marginalized in a Muslim country today, the line between marginalization and fundamentalization or radicalization is very thin. You understand? The line between marginalization and radicalization. And therefore, we came to the conclusion with the governments that maybe we should focus in a university that is educating mountain populations. Because they have been deprived of the... To come to Bishkek, they, first of all, they are poor. To send a boy or girl here, it is very difficult for them to, to support. Now you ask me the question about one line. We picked the, the, the mountains first, and uh, we picked the Pamirs, the Tian Shan, and so forth. And among them, we picked the most underdeveloped towns. Nothing was flat. It used to make bullets for the Soviet Union. It made military boots. There was hardly any, there was a slaughterhouse. 
which was also going out of business. There was nothing else. And people from Narin are the biggest migrants and the biggest money makers in Bishkek, from Narin. They have come out, they are very enterprising people. Whether it's Salim Beko or it yeah. is Shoro or it is any of these people, they are very, very enterprising. They made a lot of money. Now, in selecting this, we looked at the mountains and we looked at towns where it was not in a good shape. It turns out that they happen to be on a similar meridian. Mm. There's no magic about it. But what is interesting, when we picked those uh, locations, we didn't realize that China would be the second biggest power, economic power. And uh, we are, all our campuses are 150 kilometers from the Chinese border. <laughs> Just 150 kilometers from Tekeli, from Narin, from Koro. Now, think 25 years ahead. China may be number one or it may be number two. It's not important. It will be a very big power and it is a very big power. And it will have an influence on what all the countries in the Belt and Road and so forth. So this university is located in Narin on the old Silk Road, exactly on the old Silk Road. And it is the same in Tekeli. <laughs> it ha happened to be. I mean, we never planned it that way. <laughs> okay. So it was fortunate. It was lucky. Now, I can see in 25, 30 years, Chinese students coming, our students going. We are also building up relations with Chinese universities. So it is. we cannot only look at the West. We have to look at Russia. We have to look at China. There are beautiful institutions of education in Russia into China. I've just come recently from Tatarstan. I was very impressed by their university. We have a relationship with the University of Central Asia and the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, in St. Petersburg. We do a lot of joint activity. And it is nice to see that this relationship is, is continuing. And it's, it's wonderful. Okay, thank you. I have two more questions, one global, one private. Yes. I'll start with global. Uh, I'm asking this question to all our guests. Um, there's a feeling that uh, the world is becoming more divided, with more walls being built, even concrete walls, like in the case of Mr. Trump. Uh, but also we have case of Brexit. And uh, overall, there is a feeling that countries are setting up new rules, or new visa regulations, and uh, there is maybe we have a feeling that there is a less cooperation between the countries. At the same time, we have now big uh, environmental challenge that cannot be uh, you know, that that you know one country cannot deal with yeah, environment. The environment. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you cannot fight the uh, climate change uh, alone. So. Uh, what is really happening in the global perspective, uh, in your opinion? Well, you know, we have had a very interesting situation. We went for globalization. Many developing countries said it is not fair. It is in favor of America or in favor of China or Germany or wherever. Then those countries found out that the eastern part of the world is getting uh, prosperous. They said, hey, wait a minute, we are the losers. Because now Thailand, Vietnam, um, uh, Malaysia, China, uh, they are becoming rich. This is not fair. So they are the ones who are saying globalization is no good. Previously, it was the developing countries who were saying it is unfair because the big powers have the power. Now, the pendulum is swinging. Today, the World Trade Organization is in absolute quandary, if not disarray. Because in the arbitration of World Trade Organization, you need to have a minimum of three judges mm -hmm. in order to arbitrate anything. There's only one judge left out of five. Mm -hmm. That's because America and other countries are not appointing the judges. They are not allowing the judges to be appointed. So they want a major reform, which also takes care of their needs. Whatever then, I'm not going to argue whether they are right or they are wrong. So we have a world order that needs to go through a significant uh, thinking process. Mm -hmm. 
And in the process, we are, you and I today are going through a period where <clears throat> I hope our children will have benefited from this dialogue that's going on. There is a lot of division going on. But again, if you see ASEAN, ASEAN with the 10 countries, they have become one. If you see the Pacific Rim uh, Agreement, uh, they have become one mm -hmm. in trade. So there is globalization in a different way. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Brexit has happened, but immediately the first thing Britain is doing is to make an agreement with America. It's making an agreement with Japan. Within one or two months, you will hear about an agreement with Japan. And by the end of this uh, year, they're breaking out of uh, European Union, but they're making agreements with other countries. Mm -hmm. Though you can no longer live on your own. And I'm therefore very pleased that this country has become part of the Eurasian uh, Economic Union. I know there are advantages and there are disadvantages. But you have no choice but to become a regional, part of a region, part of a regional economy. Five million or 50 million people, you cannot do it alone. And nobody can do it alone. Mm -hmm. So the, over a period of time, this will happen. Now, the climate change that you speak about will bring the world together. And the most encouraging thing about climate change response is the young people. We are in another generation. I know I have fought for climate change for a long time. In, in Pakistan, I was leading the, the legislation for, for you know, environmental protection. And it is, it is making headway. But there are many people opposing it also. But it is the young people, it is you, who have to come to the rescue of the world. And it doesn't have any borders. The, the, the young Swedish girl, yeah. Greta Thurberg, she has many allies in Africa or in Asia or in America. So I think there is hope for us. And we, if we don't come together uh, on climate change, all of us are going to be in trouble. From the experience that you have in Pakistan, uh, what do you think Bishkek should do to, to, to solve the problem of smoke? What are the actions that, that should be taken? I don't know enough about it to make a, a judgment yeah. and to give a remedy. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm not sufficiently informed on the technical side. But I think there are some basic things all of us can do. Is how can we improve public transportation? You have electricity uh, with the trams going. I think that's a very good uh, uh, system. More of that should be. We should be looking at electric cars. Let me give you an example. In China today, there are over 200 companies that are making electric cars. Uh, an electric car from China is available for seven and a half thousand or ten thousand dollars just for the electric. No, we want to buy a BMW and we want to buy a, a Audi or we want to buy a Toyota or whatever. Why can't we buy electric cars and say, this country has electricity and we'll have more electric. So why not go for electric cars? Make a regulation that in 20 years time, all cars or 50% of the cars should be electric. Number two, this uh, heating plant that is working on coal. What are the options? Can you do any energy that is renewable? Of course, hydroelectric is there. What about wind? What about solar? Bishkek has a very large number of solar uh, sunny days in the year, which is why you had the Air Force, Soviet Air Force, uh, one of the bases was in Manas. So there is solar energy is now cheaper than making, uh, you know, fossil energy. So I would say those are simple things, but we need the political will to make that happen. Thank you. Okay, now before we go to the questions from audience, I have a personal question to you. Uh, whenever I speak to your colleagues, everyone admires your energy. Everyone is saying they get tired, you don't. And uh, what is the secret? How do you keep, how do you, how do you, uh, what do you do? What are your life hacks that you're using? Well, first of all, I have to thank Allah. 
for giving me some genes that are that are okay. <laughs> I think we all have to thank because health is something you cannot control, right? Something can happen. You have eaten some food and your bug gets into your stomach. You're finished. <laughs> um, so one has to thank God for for uh, what we have, what He has given us as genes. Secondly, I would say take up a profession or work or business or whatever you have in which you find it as a hobby. Your hobby should be, your business, your profession should be seen as a hobby so you don't get up in the morning and say, oh, I don't want to go to work in that place. <laughs> you are saying, why am I not getting up at 6 o'clock, so I'm 8 o'clock, I'm over there. So find something that is exciting to your liking. Don't get stuck into an area where... It is not easy. It is not always possible, even. But look for something where you enjoy. And enjoy many parts of life, not just work, not just family. Enjoy culture, enjoy nature, enjoy children, enjoy your parents, because life is too short. Secondly, I would say to be able to have energy you need to exercise. Many of you must be doing yoga. Some are running, some are walking, but you really have to exercise. I exercise morning and evening, not very long, 10, 15 minutes, but intensive. Mm -hmm. That makes it, uh, it gives me more energy. I sleep for about between four and six hours every day, and I'm working at least 12 hours every day. Uh, and uh, the other part that I would say that gives me a little bit of extra energy, I think, is meditation. It's something that everyone should cultivate, calming the mind. In, in, the, in, the, in the Muslim context, we think of Allah when we meditate. So it is not only in, in the Muslim context. If you are a Buddhist, you are meditating, you are, you know, Christians do that. So I think that also calms the mind and brings fresh ideas to you. So I would say those are some of the things, but don't hesitate from solving problems. Keep an keep a optimistic attitude. Look what you have done here. Without optimism, you could not have built all this. Oh, really? Yeah, that's true. You have to have faith in what you are trying to do. And many of you are working here and you are entrepreneurs. So believe in what you are doing, and energy will come. Great. Inshallah. Thank you. Uh, questions from audience? Yeah. Okay. Here, yeah, please. Could you tell me your name and, and your profession or your name? My name is Aydanish Saeva. I'm, I'm a social scientist. Uh, I was wondering, what would you say to young people who are thinking of moving to another country, given all the social, political, and environmental challenges that the country is facing now? So the question is, what would I advise or say to young people who want to migrate to another country because there are challenges in their own country? <clears throat> First of all, you have to sympathize with them. Because if they want to go somewhere else, there is a problem. Maybe they don't have a good relationship with their family, or maybe they are not looking at prospects for the future. Um, I always encourage the young people not to go. I always tell them, look into your own country. There are many, many opportunities. But go and learn from other countries. So in my own experience, I didn't. I was born in one country. I went to school in another country. I've lived in eight different countries. But I would say that for education, by all means go. Maybe you'll get experience of working in another country, but remember your own country is your own country. It has given you birth. It has given your parents and your ancestors. And you come back to them and help it. I can't, you can't put uh, handcuffs on people and say, don't go. But as young people, you can create opportunities for other young people. And let them come back. If you, if you were an entrepreneur in this 
in this uh, all along house you have created two or three jobs if you become big you will create 30 40 jobs and those young people will come back or they will never go back outside because there is opportunity here so it is not an easy answer if you are well educated you'll probably find something to do in your own country by the way being born in, in one country raised in other countries working 43 years in pakistan what do you consider as your country I'm a citizen of Pakistan right now. I own a Pakistani passport. That's the only passport I have. Um, I feel very loyal to that country in many ways. But I have also benefited. I was born in Uganda uh, and went for seven years or six years in school. I went there. I went to, um, to high school in Kenya where my parents migrated. Uh, um, and then I went to university in the UK and the United States. I went then to Pakistan. I never been to Pakistan before. Mm. After the university? Yeah, after university. And I lived in, in what is now Bangladesh. And when the country broke, I went to the other side of Pakistan. And when I finished my, um, my leadership of the Aga Khan University, my wife and I decided that we, we have our, our children live in North America. And our grandchildren, we have six grandchildren. So we uh, decided that we will move to Canada. So this is where we also have a place. And we thought we would be near our, my brother and sister who lived there for 40 years. So idea was to be together with the family. But then we go back to Pakistan, we meet our friends and enjoy. We I'm sure one day if we, if we leave uh, Bishkek, we'll come back and meet our friends in Bishkek. We'd love to. Yeah. Thank you. Question? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Ali Khan. I'm a student of International Relationships Faculty. Uh, and I want to know your opinion about uh, hijab in school and even hijab at all, at all life. How do you uh, react on this? And uh, and that's it. I'm not sure I followed the question. The question is, uh, what do you think about uh, hijab being uh, wor uh, worn in the school? Yeah. That's, that's not a complicated question. But uh, first of all, the issue of dress, hijab or any other kind of dress, it's a personal choice. As far as I understand, Islam, in the Quran, it doesn't say anywhere you must wear a hijab. It, doesn't. it says you must have modest dress. Mm -hmm. You must have modest dress. And what you do, if somebody decides that modesty is in covering the hair, for me, it is not a problem. I'm quite happy with that. Uh, there are some countries in which the laws are different. Okay, that's, diff that's a different country. But in my university in, in Karachi, uh, there were women who were wearing hijab. There were others who were not wearing it. And we never said to anybody. But if they came with an improper dress, shorts and or, you know tank tops and all of that, we said, that's not our culture. Mm. You, you don't do that. You have a modest and acceptable dress. Mm -hmm. Because we are in a culture that is Eastern culture. Even if they're Muslim culture, if you go anywhere else in the East, they are also not happy with that. So, as far as my opinion is concerned, I don't have any problem. With that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Ainura. I work in one of the projects of GIZ, the German Federal Enterprise for International Cooperation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is about you have mentioned that you come to the countries by invitation. So can you name just any major challenges you are facing uh, while implementing your project uh, in the countries? And the second question is about uh, do you have any awareness raising campaign uh, regarding what you have mentioned already about the University of Central Asia that some people might think, uh, though it is a secular university, but people have uh, some people have different opinions that 
maybe you, you are imposing you, your religion, your faith with it. So are there any uh, awareness raising campaign? Thank you. So first question was whether we have difficulties. In the what are your challenges? What are the challenges? And the second one was the perceptions about about the, the, How, what, what is your awareness campaign that you use in the countries to, to prove that you are a secular university? Yes. How do you bring this message here? So, uh, first of all, there are always many challenges when you're building a big project. Challenges of uh, building it in the first place. You know, when we wanted to build it in Narin, we didn't have any work people. I mean, we can bring them from Kazakhstan and we can bring them from uh, Bishkek, but we wanted the Narin people to build as much as possible. So 70, 80 percent of the, the workers work from Narin. We trained them two years before we built to, to lay bricks, to, uh, to weld and so on. So that was a challenge. Okay. So I think in the early days, people did not understand and people meaning bureaucracy, and, and, and people uh, who are policymakers, many understood very well, and they went out of their way to, to help. Others said, well, we don't need this. Maybe we, you should do that. And it is important to sit down with them and to speak and understand and to discuss. So patience is very important. As I told you, our, our programs are long-term programs. So we don't have a problem sitting down and discussing. So there are many challenges, and uh, in, in, including in Kazakhstan, everything is done, we, our land is there, our, our infrastructure is built for the campus. One small item it needs to go through uh, some approvals, and there is some confusion, so it is delayed. Okay, we are discussing, even today I wrote a letter to the Minister of Education and asked for, you know, review. So you have to go step by step. Secondly. How do you explain to people what your real objectives are? Because there's always a little suspicion. And we have encountered that, as you saw. There are one or two people who insist on looking at the differences and creating differences. And even, uh, for example, when I first came here, I had the opportunity to meet the Mufti, uh, Mufti Maksat. Uh, and he um, he was himself confused whether we are religious or not. So I remember going to visit with him. The interesting part is he speaks fluent Urdu. He spent seven years in Pakistan in one of the madrasas. And uh, I had no I, I took my assistant with me, uh, but she didn't have to translate anything because we spoke in Urdu. The moment we spoke in Urdu, we, it was a different. Uh, you know, approach. And then I showed him that in our charter and the treaty that is signed by the presidents of the three countries, it's very clearly written, it's a secular universe. By the way, that's not the only country or in Pakistan I was had, I had one or twice the questions like that. Until people see it and you explain to them, you don't reduce the misunderstanding. And misunderstanding and misperceptions take a long time, sometimes 10, 15 years to overcome. So I think we all have to work together to create better understanding. And uh, when I first uh, went, when the campus was being constructed, there was a lot of confusion. Oh, this is uh, what kind of religion they're going to teach here, Shia and all of that. Well. I invited a lot of the Imam Khatibs mm -hmm. to come. Forty were invited, ten didn't come. They said, we are not entering that place. Thirty came. And we sat down with them. The governor was there, the mayor of Narin was there. We sat together and I told them beforehand, you give me all the questions you have. <coughs> you, you, you speak up, just like we are now dialoguing. And they brought two sheets of questions. They wanted to know, do I pray? Of course I pray. Do you go to Hajj? Of course. Do you pray Zakat? Yeah, of course. We have a, our own system of Zakat, and that we call it Zakat. So, uh, 
how many wives you have? Because they thought I had many wives and uh, there were some temporary marriages and I don't know where this idea comes from. So I said, I only have one wife. I can't even manage one wife. Leave alone, marry. <laughs> and so for one hour we were discussing. When we discussed in this fashion, they became convinced. I think, Genghis, you were there at the time. And, and uh, Genghis was uh, doing some of the construction management at our university. And these people came and they spoke. In the next uh, iftar time, in the Ramadan, we invited all 40 came. Mm. Now every year we sit down and we break our fast together. And uh, they realize it is the same. We sit together and we offer our namaz together. What's the problem? Okay. So I think the question is a very well thought question you have. And the only way we will re remove this is by speaking to each other, learning about each other. And if there are suspicious suspicions about certain things, it's better to bring it on the table. And, and maybe uh, they can convince me or I can convince me or you and I can talk together and sort out. It's, it's not an easy thing. It will take a long time. For any, you know, for example, there is a there is a there is a sense of anxiety in the Kyrgyz uh, uh, culture about the neighbor. You know, the Manas epic is talking about the invasion of the of the of the people who came from the east or the west or wherever they came from. There is a there is a psychological uh, feeling that people from outside are going to attack. We must be very careful. So. Slowly, slowly, that is not becoming less. It's nice to see that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. My name is Albert, and I'm a student in Bishkek. So I have seen that in a lot of universities, and especially in Bishkek, there is a, like a lot of no academic freedom and like a very less amount of freedom in speech and expression. To what extent do you promote academic freedom and also freedom of speech and expression? And how do you think? It's important to a uh, to, uh, student's life. It's a very good question and a very difficult question. Uh, look, we are a university, okay? I'm now looking at the university for a moment because you're asking a question in the context of a university. There is a university has a responsibility to give freedom of expression. But there is a difference between freedom of expression and taking a license to abuse people. That's not freedom. That is abuse of freedom. For example, if I can say anything, I'm a free agent. If I started abusing him or saying bad things about him or about her, I have the right to do so. But I will not be part of that society. That society will not respect me. That society will not give me the status that I would like to have. So freedom of expression has two sides to the coin. One, ability to express yourself. And two, the responsibility with which you express yourself. It's important that each individual should exercise the responsibility to society. All right, you are in your own house. You can say something to your father or your mother or your brother, but you, you, can't, you can't abuse them. And you cannot take undue advantage. So it is a very fine line. But I do respect the freedom of expression. I think it's important for young people particularly to give their thoughts. And I sit down and I listen to them every time I'm in their company. I learn a lot. I learn a lot from young people. Thank you. Questions? Okay, while we are waiting for questions, I have one. Uh, so you've lived and traveled to many countries. Uh, from your perspective, or from a very wide perspective, what do you think, uh, that what, what are the three things that make Kyrgyzstan unique? I mean, not saying that better than other countries or worse than other countries, but really different from many other countries. <laughs> I think the nature it is quite the nature is quite unique in this country. 
I don't think that because you are born here, you may not appreciate it as much. But when I come to Bishkek or anybody comes to Bishkek and they see the beautiful mountains, I mean, you have to, you have to accept the fact that there is Allah who has given such beauty to your country. It's amazing. The second thing I find that there is a unity of culture. There is a lot of pride in your culture. Very justifiable pride. I am very pleased with that. Because every nation has its own culture and they want to preserve it, they want to promote it, and they are doing it. Whether it's through music or poetry or uh, art. Beautiful artists. I, I'm just amazed. Uh, and and it, it, is, it is so nice to see that this nation is encouraging writers. Aitmatov's philosophy is being talked about and it is being practiced. That to me is, is marvelous. I also find that these Kyrgyz people are very enterprising. This is the third thing I have noticed. They are very enterprising people. Just look at this example. Ololohos. I mean, it is just amazing what you have achieved. So, enterprising, look at the people who made money, who have gone abroad and have come back to this country. They have invested in this country. Whether it is Dordoy or it is whoever it is, Salim Beko, and, and they, they are doing all these good things for the country. And I, I think that the entrepreneurship of the Kyrgyz is underestimated. It is underestimated. Because after the Soviet Union, it was difficult for you to become entrepreneurs. By the way, the mo one of the most entrepreneurial country in the world, people in the world, is the Afghans. Mm -hmm. You put an Afghan anywhere, he will he will make money and he will survive. And he doesn't have to have a fancy uh, place to sleep. He will sleep wherever and eat whatever is available. And I think in many ways the nomad tradition of uh, of Kyrgyzstan is helping your psyche. Say, whatever we have, we have to make the best out of it. So those are the three things that I find quite unique. Yeah, by the way, you mentioned uh, artists and, uh, you know, it was interesting for me because I visited your uh, campus in Horok and then I went to Nazarbayev University and there is no single piece of art in Nazarbayev University. I mean, it's a very fancy place, buildings, but there are no sculptures, no paintings. And I was telling them that UCA actually has paintings everywhere and yeah and they said yes we should maybe think about it and I, I hope something will change so your example is great for that well, that's what we want to do we want the young people studying there to understand that art is important bread alone is not important culture is important and in this uh, uh, Narin campus we have a system in each campus 50 percent of the art is from Kyrgyzstan 25% of the art is from Tajikistan, 25% from Kazakhstan. Uh -huh. In Khorog, in, in, in Tajikistan, 50% is Tajik, 25% is Kyrgyz. The president of Kyrgyz, Tajikistan came there and he said, oh, this is not Tajik, I said, that is Kyrgyz. There was a beautiful portrait of a Kyrgyz woman. He said, but why is, this? I said, this is a university which is made of a regional hmm. character. And we want the young people to think they are in this region, they are looking at this place and they can relate to it when they graduate. So, and they want to do paint themselves. And they must think through. So that is a very important part of our, our teaching the young people. Art is a very big teacher. It's a subliminal teacher. Mm -hmm. it's also, it's important to mention in terms of Islamic culture, because uh, many people here are saying that Islam is against music, Islam is against uh, art, but against paintings. What what would be your response? Well, I'm I'm very surprised whenever I hear those people. I know there are many people, but uh, go back hundred years, they didn't have that. Hundred and fifty years ago, this was not the cry in the Ottoman Empire, which was the biggest empire of the world. 700 years, all Muslims, all Turkic, music was very important, mm -hmm. dancing was important, but everything within a certain modesty. 
and art was important. You look at all the Turkish art in the, from the Ottoman Empire. It was from from here. Art was from this was part of the Saudi Arabia was a Turkish Empire. Yeah. Only after the First World War, this is hundred years ago, Saudi Arabia was not uh, the Saudi Kingdom. It was Arabia. It was Mecca, Medina. It was Ottoman culture, and everything was acceptable. So I think these new ideas have come. I don't, I don't mind. They can have their own understanding, and it is not for me to tell somebody that I don't agree with you. I will. I can practice my way. You practice your way. You are not going to tell me what type of Islam I am going to practice. There are, there are seventy-two branches of Islam, seventy-two madhabs in Islam, seventy-two main people from. The West, when they talk about Islam and the two Shia and Sunni, that's all they understand. Within Sunni Madhab, there are dozens of, and within Shia, there are dozens. For example, in our uh, uh, Tariqa, we are the Shia Ismaili. That's one type of Shia. The Iranian Shias, most majority of the Iranians are in a different type of Shia. We have different interpretations. We have different beliefs. There are many things that are common, obviously. Uh, and in the, in the Hanafi, Madhab, in Maliki, Shafi, uh, Wahhabi, Salafi, Deobandi, these are all different. But they are all Sunni. Now, some are more strict, some are less strict. Look at your Hanafi. Such a beautiful, open, uh, sophistic approach to it. To, uh, and there's so many things that are common between the Hanafi and the Shia. The, uh, co common in terms of outlook, beliefs, and philosophy. I never had a problem understanding. So I think people can always uh, make their own interpretation, but I, I, it's fine. I don't have a problem with it. Oh, yeah. As long as they let other people right. have other beliefs. Now, for example, yeah. music has always been. Art of Islam. If you look at art, if you look at music, go back to the to the Abbasid times, go back to the Fatimid times. Uh, you know, uh, uh, idea of pluralism in the Fatimid dynasty, which is the ancestors of the Aga Khan, they had the entire uh, North Africa and right into Arabia. They had the Fatimid dynasty for, for three three hundred years. Uh, and the and the in the town of the city of Cairo was established by one of the ancestors of the Aga Khan. Mm. The uh, University of Al Azhar, Al Azhar University, all Muslims regard as a very big uh, learning center. That Al Azhar University was founded by one, the ancestors of the Aga Khan, and that's where the, one of the first universities of the world was born. So, during that time, there was a respect for all madhavas. There was pluralism. If you go to Spain, the Moors were the rulers of Spain. And among the Moors, they had Jews who were ministers, scientists, uh, generals. The same in the Fatimid dynasty. There were many people who were Christians or even Jews. So this idea that you can only have Muslims and of a particular type, it is something that is a new idea. I think we should take a broader look at the history of Islam. If you look at the history of Islam, you'll find something quite different. Okay, speaking of the broader view, uh, you've seen many countries, and obviously you've seen, because you were, uh, you were stationed in many developing countries, I think you've seen a lot of states that are very corrupted. Uh, that's one of the biggest problems in Kyrgyzstan, especially this year. We have big scandals, and uh, at the moment it looks like corruption is only growing. Uh, so what would what do you think uh, will happen in Kyrgyzstan? Do we have a chance to once have a state without corruption? If we do, what we as citizens of this country can do? Because obviously the government has a conflict of interest. 
it's not really fighting well, the corruption. I, I don't know about that, but that's let's say that every government would like to eliminate corruption. Some are good at it, some are not very good at it. Uh, sorry. Can I answer this one? Yeah, I passed. Uh, your question is, is corruption going to be really eliminated or will it yeah. go? Can we do something about it? Can we do something? The answer is definitely yes. And it is the citizens who can do something about it. And you are doing something about it. Admirably. Look at the way people are able to speak. This is the beauty of this country. You can speak. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You go to some other countries and you are not allowed to speak. So let us be thankful to the Kyrgyz culture and the Kyrgyz system and the, even the government system. I know there are always, you know, you take the whole sum. But if you look at the whole sum, look at some countries in the neighborhood, not just in Central Asia, but even other places, you are not allowed to speak sometimes. Especially against the government, you cannot say anything. So I say there is, for Kyrgyzstan, there is hope. There is hope. Now, let me give you an example. One of the most corrupt countries in the world, about 150 years ago, or a little bit more, was a place called the United States of America. Manhattan was the most corrupt place in the world. You have a look at the history of Manhattan, full of corruption. And by the way, I remember in my own lifetime that you cannot collect garbage in, Man in Manhattan without paying the mafia. The garbage was collected by the mafia. And the mafia was giving you security. And you have to pay every month for security. There is nobody attacking you except them. But they said, if you don't give me $100 for this little store, I will come and somebody will attack you. That was in the United States. Look at the history of Manhattan. They cleaned it up. It took them time. So I think as nations go, it takes time. It takes changes of government. It takes changes of the young people coming and becoming the leaders. Young people becoming older and wiser. And new generations will make the change. So for the new generations, I say, keep doing the good things. Keep bringing up the issues. But don't become impatient. Mm -hmm. It will take time. In the United States, every year, $400 billion are spent for lobbying. What is lobbying? You go to a uh, member of parliament or senate or the house of representative or you go to the state parliament and you tell them, I, I've got this, please make a change. This law is not good. I'm an oil company. I need more freedom to drill and so on. And they spend $400 billion every year. In other countries, it's called corruption. But because the law says if you are a lobbyist, you can go and lobby and spend the money. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have a law of lobbyists in this country, as far as I know. But if you had it, so you are doing it the other way. We have practice. You don't need a law. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. yeah we have a question here. Yeah. Good yeah, evening. Sorry. I, I have a question. Oh. I have a microphone. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Thanks for coming. Thanks all, all of you for providing this event. I have two questions. My name is Arena. I'm engaged in trade business. So my first question about uh, uh, education. As you said before, education is very important. And in order to get uh, qualified, good education, uh, what our government should do, what kind of specific or concrete steps we have to do, and to please share with your uh, experience. And second question, is uh, you said about your sleeping time? You sleep less than six hours. Say yes, as I heard, six or four, six four hours. hours. Yes, and uh, you know, the latest research is uh, telling that you know you have to sleep more than 
uh, seven hours. Uh, there is some contradiction, as you see, and uh, they're telling that's like it's uh, deteriorate your productivity and uh, memory. So, what do you think about it? In, uh, do you encourage other others to sleep less and do more? But please be careful. You know, <laughs> they will do that. Yeah. <laughs> but, or maybe it's like specifically designed to your body. Yeah. Sleep but six hours. Thanks. Let me answer the sleep question first, and then I'll talk about education. Look, every person has a different set of genes. Uh, there are books written recently that you must have eight hours of sleep. It, they're probably right. Most people require eight hours of sleep, so please don't go around doing what I'm doing. There is a second part to what I do. Sometimes, after lunch, I will just sit on my chair, and I will doze off for 10 minutes. Every human being has a sleep cycle of four hours awake and four hours down. Within the four hours, you have seven minutes, which is your sleep time, your downtime. This is a scientific thing. I'm not making it up. If during those four hours, at the end of that four hours, you're feeling a little drowsy and you sit back, and you relax for a few minutes, you are back again. If I sleep for 10 minutes, I can work for another eight hours. Because you have to train your mind. It is not just straightforward, simple thing. Train your mind to turn off and go to sleep. And it means that you try to relax. And don't put every bur burden of the mind right in the front. It, it is difficult, but it is a fact. So, when I go to sleep, I have a very sound sleep. Six hours, four hours. But if I get a chance, I will sleep eight hours sometimes. Why not? Uh, so, try to train your mind. And if your mind and your body needs eight hours of sleep, please don't do what I'm doing. You know, some people can lift a lot of weight, and other people cannot lift a lot. So don't don't start uh, you know, damaging your body. On the education side, the the answer probably not just for Kyrgyzstan, but for most countries, including some industrialized countries, is that there is a need for reform of education. And the most difficult reforms of any reforms that I know of are the education reforms. Because changing the curriculum requires a lot of thought, and there are traditionalists who don't want to leave this part of the, the culture, or that part of the mathematics, or that part of chemistry. So it is very difficult to change the curriculum. And in my opinion, there are two things that can happen that makes a difference in the school system or the school quality of uh, education. The first and foremost is curriculum. In this country, as an example, I am told that the curriculum has not had a major reform since at least 50 years. You are still learning what was in the old Soviet system. There have been marginal, on the margins there have been changes, but a major change towards the STEM system. Major change about what they teach in, at the IB, for example, analytical and critical thinking. You don't need to have an IB system to give you critical thinking and analytical thinking. And then the second part is the examination system. Now, how many of you are educationists or teachers or, or administrations of education? All right, there are a few. Okay. <clears throat> You know, teachers, they do not teach to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. What do they teach to? They teach to the examination. Because their evaluation by the head teacher is how many students passed, how many failed, how many came in grade one, grade two, grade three, and the teacher gets the salary increase or, or recognition according to the number of students who passed. So, what does the teacher do? Please memorize this formula. Please memorize the history 
of Kyrgyzstan in this one paragraph. And if the question comes, what is the history of your country? You write these five lines. After five years, you will completely forget what is the five lines that you thought about. So people then go, teachers teach to learn by rote learning, by memory, by memorizing and going into the examination and passing the examination because I remember the formula or I remember the dates in the history and so on. But if somebody gave me a problem, please solve this problem now that you know mathematics. Oh, I didn't know the answer to this one. So teachers train the students to pass the examination. If the examination system is changed to test your ability to think, and your ability to analyze, then you really get an educated person. This is what the IB system does. This is what the Kyrgyz system or the Pakistani system or the Indian system or the uh, Tajik system or whichever, they don't do that. I'm sorry, but that is a fact. Yeah. And so the reform that we need is in the examination system and in the curriculum, which is both are very difficult, and I've implemented both in Pakistan. And I know how tough it was. Very difficult. Thank you. One last question from the audience. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Perdali. Uh, my question for you. Uh, you know, now in the world, have some problem. Uh, for example, this Muslim countries have uh, different uh, positions, different uh, options they have. And uh, for example, uh, Shia, Shia, Sunnah, or uh, Hanafi, or like this. And I want that uh, all of Muslim countries make me make one uni unite, you know, and how we can do it, or how uh, we can solve this problem? What's your opinion of what is? It's, it's a very difficult question and it is often asked. How can we, okay, we have so many different ways of practicing Islam, but how do we bring them? The answer, to give a very short answer, let us look at the common things that are common between the different practices. Let's not look at the difference. Let's look at what is common. For example, in the Shia, most Shia will pray three times a day. Most Sunnis will pray five times. There are Sunni uh, uh, madhabs which are praying three times a day. Because you, you don't know about them, but it is a fact. Now, don't look at you are doing three times and I'm doing five times. But look, what are you praying? Look what they are, they are saying, the, 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 the surah of the Quran itself, the common surah al fatiha surah al-ikhlas, we are sp saying the same thing. Look at the similarity, then this unity will come. We believe in one Quran, yes, that is where the similarity is. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, look at what is common between us. It is easy to say, my brother has got... Uh, is tall and I'm short and look, we are from the same mother and father. Then you become brother and brother. So that's what I would recommend. That you do. Thank you. I just we 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 are running out of time. Sorry. So uh, my two last very brief questions. First, the traditional questions that we ask everyone. First, what does it mean to you to be a diplomat? What is a true diplomat? Very, very difficult, but also a very easy question to answer. No, first of all, a diplomat is a guest in the country in which mm -hmm. he or she is living. So when you are a guest in a country, you have to respect the host. It is our tradition, but it is also in any country you go, you have to respect. Uh, and so your question was, what, what does diplomat what is the real diplomat? The real diplomat. The second part, that every diplomat has been sent by his government or his organization to advance their uh, objectives. So 
you have to advance your objectives, but it cannot be against the objectives of the nation where you are. Uh, so it's a win-win. You have to find commonalities. You have to find a common uh, platform at which you can say, hey, uh, we, we can do this together. And that is easier done than people realize. There's so many common things between us as human beings or even as different nations. So I'm, I'm very comfortable in being a diplomat. Uh, of course, uh, uh, there is a uh, there is a joke, I will tell you, if the ladies will not mind. Uh, <clears throat> so they, they say that uh, if, you, if you are a diplomat, uh, you, 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 uh, you never say uh, no because you are never a diplomat. If you say maybe, it means that maybe your government will agree or maybe not agree. And if you say, uh, yes, then it becomes very difficult for a diplomat to withdraw. So to say yes, very rare. Yeah. It means maybe. If you say maybe, it means yes. No, you never say. Never say no. So they said, what is the difference between a diplomat and a lady? So I told you that when he says yes, it means maybe. And when he says maybe, the diplomat means perhaps not. And he, no, he never said. For a lady, when she says no, it means maybe. But when she says maybe, it means yes. And when she says yes, she's not a lady. <laughs> OK, I see. So uh, one last question. What are the three books that had the most influence on your life, the, the biggest impact? Well, one of the earliest books in my life was Dale Carnegie's book, uh, How to Influence and, and Make Friends and Influence People. Uh, I found that very, very enlightening, and my father gave that to me, and I was very excited to read that. The other book that I read when I was even younger was, um, it was called Mutiny on the Bounty. Mutiny. Mutiny on the Bounty. You know, the... the uh, Captain Bly, who was then uh, commanding a ship, a British ship, with a British crew about 250 years ago, and they were going to pick up from Tahiti uh, and from Hawaii the breadfruit to bring to the, to the Americas for, for the slaves who were going to eat this. And there was a mutiny on that. Mm -hmm. And it, it tell, told me about human nature. And so the, the captain was... Uh, relieved of his charge and put in a small boat and people took over and the people who took over became the citizens of Tahiti. To this day they are there. So there was another book and of course um, I read a very interesting, I'm currently rereading re a book that I have found very interesting. It is the memoir of the Aga Khan's grandfather. He, um, he was a very wise person and he's talking now about the issue of the Ottoman Empire. He's talking about the Muslim Ummah. He's talking about the British Empire and uh, what he did when he was in, in Russia during the time of the Tsar. And what was the life like during the time of the Tsar and uh, Tsar Alexander was the Tsar and it was, it is amazing. And he went to Japan and what he saw there, it was a uh, one century ago, more than one century ago, but it is giving you an idea that life hasn't changed it. And there is lessons to be learned. Thank you. So I will take one minute to give you one answer that I didn't fully give, and we talked about education. So the question was asked of the Aga Khan when he established the Aga Khan University in Pakistan. He was asked, what, why did you establish such a big university and such a big investment at the time, it was a very big investment, $350 million, let's say about 40 years ago. And he said that I thought a great deal about what would change the Muslim Ummah. You know the meaning of Muslim Ummah? Ummah means brotherhood and sisterhood. So all Muslims consider themselves as part of the same brotherhood. 
he said, I ask myself, what will change the future? And what will bring back the glory that once belonged to the Muslim? You know, we, we are scientists in this region, in Kyrgyzstan, in Kazakhstan, yeah. in, in Uzbekistan, in Tajikistan. Look at the Ibn Sina and, and, and Samarkand, yeah. Samarkand Ulubek, Bukhara. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at the, the, the discoveries they made. Algebra was done by Al Farabi from Kazakhstan. So if you look at all these things, which is what is the glory that what will bring back that glory one day? Mm -hmm. and he said, I had only one conclusion that no amount of money, no amount of riches, or no amount of military might military power will bring back the glory. It is only the development of the men and women of the Muslim Ummah, the educational development, the human development, that will make a difference to the future of the Muslim Ummah. In the last 100 to 200 years, we have not, as Muslims, invented even a ballpoint pen. Just think about it. Thank you. We are always looking to other people. So education and education and education. Thank you. That's the key. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this. Uh, I think the key phrase of tonight uh, is long time. I think uh, you've made us all think more long term. Thank you for this. Uh, maybe we'll have more patience after this conversation. I hope. Yeah, I hope we'll have more pluralism, and I'm very happy, especially when you said today that Islam is also about pluralism, because this is forgotten, I think, by many people now. And thank you for bringing up the importance of culture. Yes, not the brand alone. I hope we'll be more optimistic, and I hope we'll all exercise two times a day like you do. And I hope by the time we reach your age, we'll, we'll be able to, to be energetic enough. Thank you very much for this. It was a great...